We are going team by team, taking a holistic approach on today's episode, going through the AFC North. We're going to talk about the Steelers. Are they actually good? We're going to talk about the Ravens, who we know are good. We're going to talk about the Bengals, a lot of questions, and of course, the number one team in the AFC North, the Cleveland Browns. Make sure you like, subscribe, and stay tuned. Hi, this is Troy Polamalu, and you're listening to Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Thursday, July 8th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast back with you. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. Really, really, genuinely, thank you. Uh, I know I know what you're saying. You're saying, no, 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 no. Thank you guys. Uh, you guys make my life great, and I get that. Uh, but we do want to take a second and thank everybody in this great country, nay, this world outside of Milwaukee. Thank you all oh, for dear. being part of our audience. You're going to be okay, Jason. I'm, what do you mean am I going to be okay? I'm great. Uh, we got Jay Grizz in the house today. <sighs> Mike is uh, Mike is still out of town. We don't know when he'll come back. I mean, no idea whatsoever. The producers are shaking their heads. The expectation. Now he's backpacking, barefoot backpacking through the woods. That is right, through the deepest, darkest woods. Alone. Now, the expectation right now is one more show without Mike. Right. And then we'll get uh, back to poor shows. That's a shot at Mike. That was a shot across the bow, yes. Maybe because, I mean, Jay Grizz is decked out in his son's gear mm. for this fantasy football show. Yeah. <laughs> welcome. Um, but welcome in. We, we're into the divisional breakdown shows. So we are in the AFC North today. Uh, these are very, very important shows. Jason, we were on our way back from the NBA Finals Game 1 victory yesterday. Yes, we were. Uh, and we were talking in the uh, vehicle as we were, you know, in between celebrations uh, about how fundamental and foundational these shows are for for the 2021 season. Yeah, the, the truth is, like, these, the, for us, for us, these aren't the most fun shows to do. They require a lot of preparation, um, and, and there's a lot to get through. But, but they you know are how we super, feel about preparation. I know, but they are super important because it allows us to take a holistic approach of an NFL team. We go team by team. We're going to go through all 32 here um, for today, and really that helps you get a better outlook on the individual players that you're going to be drafting in fantasy by, by seeing the range of outcomes of the team and then I think that that applies all the way down. So, like, you know, today we'll talk about a couple, you know, second-year wide receivers and how they slot in on their teams because those are players I usually target. We also have buy-sell on the show today, maybe some mailbag if we have time, NFL news, probably some hype to talk about as well because we want to get you want to get you right, want to get you ready for 2021. You can find us on YouTube, youtube.com slash the fantasy footballers if you want to watch the show. Check out the most finely groomed Jay Grizz I've seen in quite some time. Um, subscribe, click the bell over there. We'll let you know when we're going live. We do special events all through the year. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. The community is jointhefoot.com and the draft kit is ultimatedraftkit.com. Let's do some buy sell. Buy or sell, presented by Pristine Auction. Slight distraction before I give you the buy sell, uh, because Al Borland, who is here alongside uh, Judge Giamatti, made the observation. I I did too. When when Troy Polamalu introduced the show, like we had him on this show last year, and now I had always said Polamalu. Yeah, it's Troy Polamalu. He's saying his name wrong, but he says Polamalu. Right, but like it's a it's a subtle difference. It's right. a pole instead of a Paul. Like tr Troy. <laughs> you know, I feel like you should know how to say your name. So you're saying he's making a mistake. Well, right, because I say Tro Troy Palomalu. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't... I'm you trust him to say his name? I, I do. I tend to think he's got it right. Weird. But I think people have been messing up for a long time. Yeah, based on how he says his name, we all have been getting it wrong forever. All right, buy, sell. 
I like this topic. It's a player I've been thinking a lot about. DK Metcalf, buy or sell. Will he have a higher fantasy finish than in 2020? Last year, he was the wide receiver seven in fantasy. He is being drafted as the wide receiver six right now. Entering year three, took the league by storm at the beginning of the year. Weeks one through nine, he was the wide receiver two. It slowed down. Weeks 10 through 17, he was the wide receiver 25 in total points. 39 in fantasy points per game. What say you about DK Metcalf? Because I've seen a lot of strong opinions about Mr. Metcalf. Those that believe that he is all but a guarantee to be in that top five. But then those that that think the end of the year was more prescriptive and you're going to see, uh, I guess, more of that than you did the first half of the year. Yeah, it, it makes sense. I think both sides have to be factored in. When I left last season, I remember thinking that uh, DK Metcalf was a guy I'm going to stay away from at the draft price he's going to cost because they made offseason changes in Seattle with their coordinator specifically because they felt they were throwing the ball too much, you know, letting Russ cook at the beginning of last year. They slowed it down, ran the ball more through just a little less. It wasn't a drastic change. But then in the offseason, um, you know, they, they couldn't come to terms with their offensive coordinator because of the change of philosophy wanting to get back to running the ball. So when you factor in what you saw at the end of the year, which was not great DK Metcalf, like you said, he was in the wide receiver 20s. Like he was not a fantasy difference maker. And the change of coordinator getting to run the ball more, um, I, I was very anti DK Metcalf. Now that I've had time to process, statted these teams out, and really taken a look, DK Metcalf is an efficiency type of player over a volume type of player he can have a million deep shots and if the offense is going well which can happen when Seattle runs the ball like I don't know why I know we're we mock us you know establishing the run and you know the, the the efficiency of passing being better in modern NFL but the reality is the Seahawks, if they want to run the ball more, they're still going to be a great offense because they have Russell Wilson. You, We don't mock the Titans. No. Right? No, not at all. For their for their offensive philosophy, nor do we think that that efficient offense can't benefit A.J. Brown or Julio Jones. When it comes to D.K. Metcalf, I will buy that hell of a better season. And I believe that uh, the odds are slightly in favor of him being that like, I think he can finish number one. Let me put it yes. that way. Yes, there aren't can. that many that could finish number one. When you really look at last season, it's easy to break down in those fantasy terms and say, okay, the fantasy points per game were this way. He slowed way down, yada, yada. Here's what it came down to. Two touchdowns in eight weeks. That's what it came down to. He was a double-digit touchdown wide receiver last season. Go look at the career of Des Bryant. That is a player, a physical specimen that I could, you know, you look at, and he had three years in a row in the middle of his career where he was putting up double-digit touchdown seasons, every year was inside the top seven, had a top three finish. I think he was number two one year. Metcalf is built like that. Metcalf, all but, like if you had to place money bets on double-digit touchdowns over the course of the year for any wide receiver, how is he not at the top of those lists? Yeah, I mean, he's top three uh, for sure when it comes to projecting touchdowns and and you're right that was the big difference the second half of the year he was on pace for 88 receptions the first half when he was dominating he was on pace for 87 so it's about now much much better yards per game in the first half so you had deeper passes connecting and that's really what it was is the second half of the year the deep passes weren't connecting and I think that you saw Russell Wilson turn the ball over you saw them have some struggles offensively if they get the running game going it could very well open things up for DK Metcalf. Do I, if I had to bet money, I would take the field. I would say he has a slightly worse season than wide receiver seven. Um, but I don't, I don't think he is being, you know, mispriced uh, being the wide receiver six. It, he is currently in my rankings at wide receiver six. So you should say I should, I should buy. But you know, whenever you're right on the cusp, it's probably a smarter, wiser bet to take the entire field of every other potential wide receiver out there yeah he's our consensus eight as a group so he's outside that range as a group um so he's it, that's why he, brooks chose that sneaky line of wide receiver seven but i'm gonna buy it i am rising on his uh, potential 
I just think he can't be stopped. I mean, genuinely. I, th- I don't think there's a recipe to stop DK Metcalf. Uh, he's got an efficient quarterback that throws touchdown passes. Um, I, you know, and the volume was pretty good. I mean, 80-plus receptions is pretty good for a guy that size. All right, that was Buy Yourself from Pristine Auction, pristineauction.com. Great friends of the show. Use the code BALLERS. Get a $10 credit towards sports memorabilia. Let's talk news. News and notes from around the league. Presented by Sleeper. All right, let's start here. The Patriots wide receiver, Nikhil Harry, has requested a trade from the team. Well, that makes sense because he came in with hype. He was a first-round NFL draft pick, drafted to be great, and uh, has since done nothing. They don't, the, they being the Patriots, don't care that they spent a first on him if he's not as good as their undrafted rookie wide receiver the same year, um, Jacoby. Jacoby Myers, then you, you're going to put the best player on the field. So they're trying to capitalize and find another team who wants to invest because they see that the Patriots are pretty much out on Nikhil Harry being a great wide receiver. They being the agents? Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is a move brought on by Nikhil Harry's agent. This is a move as a result of two years and a combined something 80 targets which at least from Nikhil Harry's perspective he didn't get enough to show what he can do but you know something didn't something didn't work there and you look at Bill and his first round flops I mean I guess you you can call Sony Michelle a success enough if he helped lead you to a title but long term I mean Sony could get cut this year we don't know so um, what do you do if you're a dynasty manager of Nikhil Harry? Do you believe that this is good? Like, let's say he's already on your roster. Is this good news for Nikhil Harry's outlook? In he his has future? no future in New England, so yes. But I don't think he's going to be traded because I don't think that they're going. I just don't know if he finds a partner. Yeah, the, the I mean, what would you be trading for him? I mean, seventh a round sixth, pick, seventh yeah. round pick, and so. The, the issue there becomes, okay, let's say, well, he's not going to make it for the Patriots. Another team trading for him, well, that sounds good on paper until you realize they're trading nothing for him. There's no investment. So he's still got to go prove it wherever he goes. I think it it's worth bringing up that Jacoby Myers is not talked about a lot this offseason. Hasn't been. You have the acquisition of Nelson Aguilar, who was, you know, you talk about the deep passes last year. He was one of the most targeted and effective in terms of catch percentage, deep targets in the NFL last season. They added him to the roster. They signed Kendrick Bourne. Everything so far with Jacoby Myers in the offseason has been positive. Well, do you add the two pass-catching options in Jonu Smith and Hunter Henry? There's no future for for Nikhil, so moving on is the best uh, situation without question. But it's not a great situation if you drafted him number one in your dynasty drafts. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't get cute and try to trade for him trying to hope no. that it gets better. No, the odds are very much against him, having not broken out through his first two seasons. Clyde Edwards-Alaire, Patrick Mahomes, they have both suggested that the Chiefs should throw the ball more to the running back. Well, okay. I, I, I mean, they're going to have to. That's my, that's my belief. They're going to have to do that. Why? Because they have a very... Uh, inconsistent wide receiver too on their team who seems to mentally be there some games and mentally not be there some games. And that's McCall Hardman, who is their number two. Uh, Lizard King's gone. Sammy Watkins. Yeah, Sammy Watkins is gone. Obviously, Kelsey, Tyreek are going to demand a ton of targets. But this is the best thing for the team to do is to get back to an offense like they had with Cream Hunt where they do involve Clyde over to Zolaire. Yeah, I mean, the reason for all the mega hype when he was drafted in the first round last year and Clyde Edwards-Alaire shot up draft boards, he was a back-end RB1, or the, or back into the first round last year, was because of the pass-catching work from college and the tying that to this offense that Andy Reid has used his quarterback to throw the ball to the running back. That didn't happen year one as much as we would have liked if they throw the ball more to Clyde you could you're talking about a top five back because the touchdowns can come touchdowns we talk about it's not a very sticky stat yeah, he had four last year. yeah the opportunity if 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 four turns into eight which is very reasonable with that offense 
and you add some pass catching work, he's going to be a fantastic pick. I was really regretting. I mean, we just brought up on a recent episode Michael Thomas being a, a great pick, and I regretted taking in our shared uh, Scotty Fish team Michael Thomas over Clyde edwards Lair. I am definitely warming on the uh, kind of year-delayed breakout for Clyde edwards Lair. I think they're going to need him, and uh, I think he has the talent to still deliver in a great offense. Like All those peripheral, non-Clyde-related factors are present in Kansas City, right? Yeah. So then you have to determine, is this a good player or a bad player? I don't think we saw a bad player on the field last year. I thought you saw the variance in touchdowns, lack of pass catching. Um, He's you know. a third-round pick this year. Right. I mean, what's his floor? What he did last year? Yes. So in the third round, that's that's a good pick already with upside. I, I like CEH a lot. All right. There were some cut candidates brought up by beat reporters recently. I'm going to go through them quickly, all running backs. Mark Ingram, that running back room in Houston is it's, it's crowded. too many of them. I would expect Rex Burke had to get the cut over Mark Ingram, but that's fine. Either. They can both get cut. Uh, Benny Snell from almost taking over the job from James Conner to maybe being pushed out. It would make Kalen Balaj the clear handcuff to uh, Najee Harris. Mm -hmm. I do expect that to happen. I think that the ship, the very slow ship that is Benny Snell has, just, has sailed. I think the problem was they got a lot of opportunity to see him last year. And if they didn't, if James Conner could have stayed healthy, then maybe they still would have believed in Benny Snell. They need versatility. Like Najee brings, they need their backup to have versatility. Snell can't catch the football. Bills running back Matt Breida expected to be on the chopping block. Broncos running back Royce Freeman. This is the only one that matters to me because if you take Royce Freeman out and it's just a, you know two good running backs in, in Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams, then Javante has more... Uh, opportunity for fantasy relevance without Melvin Gordon going down. All right. That was today's news and notes brought to you by sleeper. You can head over, get the sleeper app, switch your league to the fastest growing fantasy platform today. If you'd like to, I suggest it. They keep improving that darn platform every single year. Yeah. They're, they're very nimble and like they, you, oh man, well, actually you, not like you. I am nimble. I am quick. I am surprisingly athletic. Um, but no, they, they make awesome changes. I, I like the sleeper platform quite a bit. All right. We've got a divisional breakdown to get into, Mr. Moore. Okay. Before we do, I want to help the Foot Clan keeps their hair, though, because two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they are 35. That's more than 50 million men in the U.S. suffering from male pattern baldness. So, like, if me, baldness. you, and yeah. Brooks are in a room together. Well, now it. Well, now it's two out of three men have done it, and you know, <laughs> and congratulations, Andy. You, it's not you, but look, uh, if you want a simple, stress-free way to keep your hair, there's convenient virtual doctor consultations. Medications delivered straight to your door every three months. You don't have to leave your home. Treatments start at just $10 per month. They offer generic versions. It's a highly reviewed five-star company, more than any of its competitors. And prevention is the key. Treatments could take four to six months to see results, so you want to act fast. If you're ready to take action, prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash footballers to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keeps, K-E-E-P-S dot com slash footballers to get your First month free. Keeps.com slash footballers. We also want to thank Babbel. I mean, people are traveling again, and uh, I've got friends that are going abroad. They're going to France, Jason. You ever been to France? I have never been to France. Uh, neither have I. But there are a lot of people travel. I'd love to go. I'd love to go overseas, do the Europe trip. Um, look, Babbel can help you get the most out of your travels abroad by helping you learn the language of your destination uh, Babbel is the number one selling language learning app. This means you could know how to order in a restaurant, Jason, or ask for directions or gain a deeper understanding of the culture. And they make the process really, really easy. When I got into the Babbel uh, platform, I chose Spanish. We are out here in Arizona. There's a lot of uh, Spanish speakers out here. And that is a language that is a, a benefit to everyday life to have an understanding of. Their 15-minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. So you've got to check it out. If that's on your to-do list, 
Uh, right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you get an additional three months for free. Oh, it's like a BOGO. Yeah. Uh, that is six months for the price of three, Jason. Uh, just go to babbel.com and use the promo code FOOTBALLERS. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com. Code FOOTBALLERS for an extra three months free. Let's get divisional. AFC North breakdown time, Mr. Moore. Let's start at the top. The okay. best team in the division, Andy. Ah, as far as last year's records. Yes, that's true. The Pittsburgh Steelers were 12-4 and four last season. They started. 11 and 0. Do you remember that? I do remember. And I remember during the 11 and 0 run thinking what a sham it was. And I think it was proven to be a sham. They finished 1 and 4. They lost in the wild card game to Cleveland. Uh they were 7 and 2 in one score games. Great defense, very close finishes. That one score game metric, that's a tough one to stay consistent with year over year. I remember back in the day when the Cardinals had one of those things where it was like all of these close single score games went their direction. And I thought it was because we know how to close out games. And it turns out it's just sometimes the ball bounces different directions, sometimes towards you, sometimes towards the other guy, and you lose close games. When, they, when you're that much of a winner in, in that close of games, it means you are above expectation for your roster. Yeah, and I, I look, I'll, I'll be honest, right out of the gate, I am not a believer in the Pittsburgh Steelers this season. I do not think that we will be entering the AFC North Divisional Breakdown show next season and talking about the Pittsburgh Steelers first. I think we'll be talking about them third. Uh, and, and Vegas agrees. I mean, Vegas has their win total at eight and a half. Really? Yeah, they have both Cleveland and Baltimore with higher win totals by a, a margin. I believe they're both at ten and a half, and the Steelers are two games ahead of the Bengals by the Vegas odds for this season. That's exactly where I see them. I see them as a third place team on the NFL field. Now that might not matter for your fantasy team. You can have production from this roster. I think the storylines when you talk about Pittsburgh begin with Big Ben. 40 pass attempts per game last year. Uh, that led the league in attempts. Offensive line was atrocious. We know that. Defense was great. Kept them in games. And Big Ben is an experienced quarterback. That does give you an advantage late in one-score games. They decided to completely revamp the offensive line and replace their offensive coordinator this offseason and then invest a first-round draft pick in star running back Najee Harris. Thank they, you. They draft... Is that you? Are you Najee? No, I'm thanking you for calling him a star running back. Yeah, he's a star collegiate running back. Great. Yeah. I just, uh, he deserves I mean that, that. I think a first-round pick is, is proof positive that that's the case. Yeah, Sony. Yeah, well, Sony was a star, quarter, uh, yeah. star running back. No, he wasn't. In college? Yeah, I didn't like him. Didn't like his tape. Okay. I'm just happy to hear I you just, talk nicely about Najee because it's usually been Mike and I fighting for Najee and you pumping the brakes on him. So I appreciated you calling. I the pumped star. the brakes relative to you guys. That's fair. Yeah, and not necessarily not liking the talent or ability. The storyline has been this offensive line. The storyline has been, you know, we want to just kind of grant like tenure to the Steelers' running game, right? Like they they just want to run the football and they've wanted to run it long enough, so they're just going to be able to run the football because they're great. Well, they actually haven't ran the ball a lot. You know, it pretty much it, it's funny how fantasy managers think differently than than NFL, you know, owners and, and people that care more about football than fantasy, because what Mike Tomlin does is he uses one back, one running back. He wants someone to be out there in all positions where you don't know if you're passing or running. He can catch the ball. He can run the ball. And because of that and that back ending the year with usually a large amount of total touches, we think of them as a team that runs the ball a lot. But they actually usually end up very low in the rankings of rushing attempts uh, because they only use that one guy. And when you add up all the other players, it's like it was just that one guy. Uh, so this is a team that throws the ball a ton, and I expect they still will, but they cannot possibly want to throw it like they did last year. 32nd in rushing yards last season, 20th in pace of play, 28th in rushing attempts, 27th in rushing touchdowns. 
you're a hundred percent right. I mean, they they literally ran through the air at the end of the year. They basically hit a wall and they gave up. And then it was two or three four yard passes, Juju eating up the middle of the field. They can still do that. Um, but this offensive line it ended the year in 2020 with a rank of 17, according to Pro Football Focus. It begins 2021 with a rank of 29th in at the NFL level. Now the question I have, you know, that everyone wants to know is, does it matter at all because of the things you said? You say. Look, he, he has one back out there. If they cut Benny Snell of his Najee, opportunity, opportunity will trump efficiency even if this offensive line struggles. And I mostly believe that. I mostly believe that to be the case. If you look at the, the pro, either you have to throw the pro football focus offensive line rankings completely out the window, which is fine if you want to do that. But, I mean, just look at last season, 26 in the league, Minnesota. Did they have a running back that produced for fantasy? Yes. Okay, what about 27th, Ezekiel Elliott and the Cowboys? Yeah, he produced enough. What about 28th, the Dolphins? Do they have an efficient running game? Uh, enough to have Miles Gaskin be fantasy relevant. Okay, here's one that doesn't count, but the Jets at 29 didn't have anybody. No. But 30, Joe Mixon, 31, Saquon Barkley, 32, the Chargers with Austin Eckler. You, If you have a guy out there on the field that can catch the football, which I think that might be the prerequisite for all those players, right? Cook, Elliott, Mixon, Barkley, Eckler. They're if, three down backs. They're they, three down yeah. backs. Yeah, I, I agree. But he's going to have to throw it to Najee for you to get what you want this year. And he will. He will throw the ball to Najee. Najee is an absolutely excellent pass catching back. He he doesn't get enough credit there simply because he's big. He's a large, big bodied running back, and you just don't usually see those guys catch the ball. This is why Mike and I are in love with the talent. Now, the team, I do think, I, look, I've come around. I think the team's going to stink. Like, I want them to be a great team because of Tomlin. I believe in Mike Tomlin. I think he's one of the best coaches in the league. I think he's going to get the most out of his players. I just don't know that he's got the players for it. When when they lost their playoff game, and you saw Big Ben on the bench last year after a horrific performance over the stretch of, like, six weeks, and he was, like, crying on the bench, I was like, well, that's the last we'll ever see of Big Ben because he doesn't have it. Is toast. So the only chance that the Steelers get better is that Big Ben somehow gets better this year, which, I, look, I know I don't do baseball, but he got the Tommy John surgery. That's supposed to become your arm gets better, right? Isn't that a thing? No, it's not a thing. Okay, well, then great, because outside of some crazy narrative like that, I don't see how Big Ben goes this from being— This isn't a rookie of the year situation. <laughs> right. Where oh, you have man. the surgery and you come back with a fastball. The absolute dream. The absolute dream. Some accident causes me to have a superpower. Well, look, I think the argument that Mike has made, to be fair to his, his narrative here with the Steelers, is simply that maybe his arm is more healthy now after another year post-surgery than it was last year. But it's not going to be – he has age working against him. Right. He doesn't have, you know – and it's been a little while. Now, Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, Juju, these are all very valuable wide receivers. And, again, if you if you finish 8-8, eight and eight, which is where – or 9-7, and seven, where Vegas has them, doesn't mean that these guys can't be valuable parts of your fantasy team. My money's on Deontay because I want the volume. I'd rather have the volume in the offense – then counting on efficiency from Big Ben, especially if they transition to a running offense. If I'm looking at these three wide receivers, my money, uh, as far as w who I'm willing to draft, would be on Chase Claypool because I don't see Big Ben having a great season, and so I want the touchdowns versus the volume. Uh, I, I get the argument of saying, especially what we saw with Big Ben last year where he dinks and dunks and just can barely throw the ball as quick as possible he snaps it and throws it that doesn't benefit chase claypool but i believe in wide receiver two or wide receivers coming into their second year taking that second year leap um it really is a second year leap now it used to be a third year wide receiver leap like a decade ago but it's year two when they break out so i want to take the shot at chase claypool See, i think he's gonna move I, we disagree strongly there because i think he's gonna move away from what doesn't work and we start we started to see that part of his game failed to be successful so why would he go back wait which part of his game because when he started getting the ball out super duper uber quick they just got worse and worse and worse like it wasn't you're, you're good talking the about the offense as a whole i'm talking about look at peyton manning at the end of his career you had to move your offense to facilitate what the elbow could do that's my point is if he can't throw the ball deep because of the age because of the transition in the offense why is he going to make that the focal point 
well, that that's the part of the game that struggles. Because it, Claypool, when he doesn't get that target, will give you five straight games outside the top 35. I guess the, the difference here is I don't think Claypool only scores deep touchdowns. I think when you're in the red zone and you have the big body, that's an advantage. They also, if you remember last year, they started giving him a lot of carries near the goal line on jet sweeps because he's got crazy athleticism and he scored a couple of touchdowns that way on the ground. So um, it's not just a 60-yard bomb as Claypool's only opportunity. If there was a gap in their ADP of significance, I could buy it. But it's not that big. It's 509 to 612 right now. Claypool could end up being nothing for my team. Deontay cannot be nothing for my team. 612 sounds like a better deal. Uh, and now what are we doing with Juju? We talked about Deontay versus Claypool, but could Juju be the one here? I'd rather eat raw fish than draft Juju. But I know that there are some raw fish you like, right? You've None. Had, oh, you don't like? Uh -uh. Foolish man. So you're the sushi connoisseur. Yes. Are you all over Juju? Um, no. <laughs> no, I'm not. But he actually does have the best uh, draft value. He's going third in the seventh He's round. He's going six picks behind. And I think if I had to look at Deontay. Uh, Deontay Johnson is the one I don't want the most because he's a fifth rounder. And in the fifth round, I think there are great wide receivers. This is the oh hope that you get 180 targets. I don't think oh. that happens. So you're willing to, to take the second-year leap narrative with him with Claypool, but the third year for Deontay is not something you're willing to believe in. It's ironic that you you brought up... 163 that, target pace last year. He's going to be phased out. Uh, you, you brought up that you don't think that the draft value is wide enough. I disagree. Where Deontay Johnson is being drafted is ahead of Cooper Cup, ahead of Tyler Lockett. Those, like, that's, I'm not taking Deontay Johnson ever in that range. Um, whereas Claypool might, you know, be, be only a round and a half later, but when you look at the wide receivers going after him, it's DJ Chark and well, Juju. They begin the season at Buffalo, Jason. So we're going to get to see this, uh, Pittsburgh teams, what 11 and 0 start last season. That may be challenged quickly in Buffalo for week one. Then they play the Raiders, the Bengals and in Green Bay in Green Bay. So that'll be an interesting start to the year as we get to see Najee Harris for the very first time. Yeah, Najee is really the only player I actively want from this roster. Okay. But I'm fine At with At their Chase. draft prices? Yeah, I'm fine with Chase Claypool. Um, Eric Ebron will be a streamer through the season. Um, yeah, he doesn't get talked about, but you're right. But you the know. only player like I like. Like, I would love to leave a draft with Najee if I get him a value. If I leave with Chase, I'm fine with that, but I'm not, like, targeting him in my drafts. Final word on Najee is that if he doesn't get the passing game work, which is not a guarantee because we've watched, we've Clyde watched Clyde Edwards Alaire last year, Clyde Edwards Alaire uh, Josh Jacobs coming into the league with only that pedigree, even Miles Sanders to a degree in the year one, it took a while, not a guarantee. So if that doesn't happen and you have a bad offensive line, it could be low ceiling. Okay. Yeah. Per, maybe high floor, maybe 10 points is guaranteed from Najee every week. You could definitely be disappointed in Najee. Um, it, it, there's no guarantee he gets passing work, but I believe he will, and I don't think you will be disappointed. All right, let's talk about the second-place team last year, but with the highest win total projection heading into 2021, the Baltimore Ravens. They finished 11-5. and five. It was a roller coaster ride. Tale of three seasons. I've read that book. It's a good one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's got the whale in it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Moby Dick. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Moby Dick was one of the main characters of Tale of Three Seasons. I thought so. Yeah. Uh, they started the year five and one, then they lost four or five games, and then they won five in a row heading into the playoffs. This was the resurgence of Lamar at the end of the year. If you had him in the beginning, you were not disappointed. You were devastated. This was you had to pay so much to get Lamar, and then weeks one through eleven, which is the fundamental part of your fantasy season, where you were building your playoff team. To make the playoffs, he was the quarterback nine. Yeah. And you probably play in a 10 or 12 team league. So you had the quarterback nine that you had to spend a, what, a second round pick on? Which means you didn't have a great running back or wide receiver core, one of those two. And you very well did not make the playoffs to enjoy his incredible run from weeks 13 through 17. Now, someone like Mike, the fantasy hitman, right, who traded for Lamar Jackson midseason, bought him at a value, uh, you know, when, when he was struggling. 
actually made it to the playoffs and enjoyed that. That That's was the way to do it. That's, <laughs> that was the way to do it. So the question now is the – the receiving, the passing game is everything for this team. Like, that's what we have to nail down. That's what we have to, as fantasy managers, figure out. What does the passing game look like for the Ravens? Because I know how I view it. I, I, I believe I have a pretty clear picture of, you know, what, what I think will happen. But I'm curious your take on 2021 Ravens passing. Okay. Last year, 32nd in pass attempts, 32nd in passing yards. Um, pace of play, 31st. We've talked about the small pie. That's what we're talking about, about total pass attempts. The, it's it's an efficient offense, but you don't get a lot of opportunity. 62 plays a game, eight fewer than the top teams in the league. So it's a, it's a slower run-centric offense where Lamar is going to tuck it. Um, I think that, by the way, small sidebar here, Mike's strategy of trading for Lamar late in the year, it's worth mentioning it again. We talk about drafting quarterbacks late. That doesn't mean we don't want a great quarterback. Mm -hmm. We want the best quarterbacks. Oh, yeah. I would rather have the best than the worst. So if someone drafts, uh, let's go through the elites, you know, the Allens, Lamars, um, Kyler, Kyler, Mahomes. Mahomes. If someone drafts them high and they go through a lull and you can get them on the cheap, go for it. Yeah. Because you're getting, you're not paying the draft value. But anyways, back to the passing game. Here's what I know about Baltimore. They don't throw it a lot. They were extremely discontent with the receiver core, as they should be. So that's a chicken or egg, right? Why throw the ball a lot if you're very discontent with the guys that are trying to catch the football, right? You went out last year. You, you kicked the tires on Des Bryant in the year because you couldn't get enough out of uh, look, Hollywood's a good player. You didn't just kick the tires. You put the tire on the car, man. <laughs> I mean, they literally put Des on the field and you threw put the, the ball. Ball tire on the car. Like, oh, I gotta drive on something. That's right. And then at the off season, they go out. They sign Sammy Watkins. They draft Rashad Bateman. Hollywood can't function as your only option. That's not a. That's nothing against Hollywood Brown. But he was their only kind of viable option outside of Mark Andrews. Yeah, so. Willie Sneed is. He's yeah. Not, you got, I mean, he's not enough. No, no. He, he he's a he's a wide receiver four or five for an NFL team, and he was thrust into being the wide receiver one two uh, so, over the last couple of years. So my and I'll, I'll hand you the mic. So I, I want to hear what your breakdown is. But my thought is this: Look, they're uh, they were eleven and five. They're a year removed from being, you know, Lamar Jackson with a ten percent touchdown rate and being the talk of the town, winning the MVP. They've had success doing what they're doing. They're going to pick their spots on offense. There could be value week to week with Rashad Bateman early on. But they're still not going to be in the top half of the league in pass attempts. There's just no way that's going to happen. Yeah, the the way that I see this is, uh, look, they just spent back-to-back first-round picks on wide receivers. They went out after every wide receiver in free agency and tried to sign them, whether it was Juju or... Galladay, they struck out. Nobody wanted to go to the small pie. But from the Ravens' standpoint, you look at what their transactions are showing you, they want to throw the ball more. But you're right, they've had success, they've got a good defense, and they are otherworldly at running the ball. So I think Lamar has a great season. I think Rashad Bateman coming in really helps Lamar. I think it's huge. Um, I think it helps Marquise Brown from an NFL standpoint. But it makes me OUT on all the receiving options. Like, a lot of people, I mean, Rashad Bateman was some people's absolute favorite rookie prospect coming in this year, and they want him. I've seen people, oh, I've scooped him up in every league I can get my hands on him. And it's like, that's great. He He's very talented. I don't want him. I don't want to touch this pie. I did last year with Brooks, Marquise give me, Brown. Give me Rashad Bateman's ADP when you get a chance. And um, Looks like it's uh, about the 12th round. So, uh, I mean. That's my flyer if I'm taking one. Really? It's I'll take a 12th round flyer on Bateman, yes. I will not. That's fine. I think no one's going to be hurt by saying no thank you to the passing uh, the receiving weapons in Baltimore. I yeah. agree with that. You I, you can say, yeah, they're not on my list and that's totally fine. Yeah, I mean, outside can, of Mark Andrews. We can say that Hollywood disappointed for fantasy purposes. He was great the second half of the year cuz he was scoring a touchdown every game. Um, but he was good for the Ravens and now they're not going to go away from him just because they they didn't draft 
Rashad Bateman because Hollywood not wasn't replacing. good enough. No. They drafted Rashad Bateman because they need multiple good wide receivers on the field. That's all going to come back to Lamar. I think Lamar has a bounce back season and is very, very good. So to illustrate that, you just said Hollywood was really great for the Ravens last year. But for fantasy, being great for the Ravens meant never finishing as a wide receiver one in any single week in 2020 and four weeks inside the top 24. So you can be a great producer for the Ravens offense and be irrelevant for fantasy. Yeah, because the passing game is so teensy tiny. I expect them to be more like 27th, 28th in pass attempts and yards this year. So are you, if you're not taking flyers on the wide receivers, are you taking a flyer on Gus Edwards? Week 6 to 16, he was the... Uh, he was their RB1. He averaged 9.7 points per game. They gave him a financial uh, package to extend him this year. J.K. Dobbins gets the press. Gus gets the rock. Is he going to share this? I mean, it's a third-round pick versus a tenth-round pick for the number one running team in, in, in football. You know, number one in rushing attempts, number one in rushing yards, number three in rushing touchdowns. Here's a tenth-round pick that could literally get 50% of the work. Yeah, I mean... It when you are drafting as late as Gus Edwards, which is basically you know a, a, a free pick, I am fine um, taking that shot on Gus. But I, you know, he's he's just like all the Ravens running backs; they're not throwing the ball a lot um, during the stretch that J.K. Dobbins took over, which was weeks eleven on. Um, Gus was fine; he was the running back twenty four, but he was the running back twenty four because of volume week in and week out where he never was horrific, but he never was great. You know, I'm looking at his game logs from that stretch on. He's running back, you know, 26, 28, 67, 31, 23. One where he was 12, 32, 20. It's just an accumulation of enough stats. I don't think that's a guy I want on my roster. I really don't. But I don't blame anyone for taking the shot of... Uh, Bateman in the 12th, Gus in the 10th. Because, I, I mean, that's the way it is. I would you got to take a rhythm. I would take Gus in the 10th then because I would rather be invested in the running game than the passing game. 10.5 is what Vegas has their win total at. They start in Las Vegas, then Kansas City, Detroit, and Denver. So uh, when you're looking at that early season, not too shabby. Does the addition of Rashad Bateman do anything for Mark Andrews? Does it, does it take away some of the market share? Does it hurt y your feelings towards... No, Mark Andrews? No, it doesn't. Not yet. I mean, uh, you know, if Bateman makes an early, early impact, maybe it does, but I still think that there's a mind meld between Lamar and Mark Andrews in high-pressure uh, situations that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. They just need to throw the ball to J.K. Dobbins. Oh, my goodness. If they just do that. Yeah, which they haven't shown that they will, but if they did. I mean, this offseason, there's been a lot of talk about it. Oh, yeah. But thankfully, for the first time, it's talk coming out of Ravens camp as opposed to talk coming from all around uh, people watching the Ravens. Yeah. Everybody's always been like, throw the ball to the running back. But now they're talking about... He's not going to. You don't think so? No, I do not. Because what do you put the odds of? Zero. Zero? No, no One percent. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, you added two downfield weapons to this roster with Watkins and, and Bateman and... It's it's about your, it's about what he does in the pocket he, and when he tucks it and runs it. I don't think it's conducive to the kind of check down situation that we like to see. So unless you're talking about design plays to yeah, J.K. Dobbins, that is what I'm talking. I about. don't see why they do that. Maybe a, maybe a, a wheel in, route a game or something. Yeah, they'll um, work it in a little bit more. But I, I do agree with you. I don't expect them to pass a ton to them. There are articles up on the website, thefantasyfootballers.com, a case for and case against article for J.K. Dobbins. If you want to dig deeper there. All right, is it time to talk about the number one team in this division yet? Uh, the Cleveland Browns? Yes, sir. Yeah, they they were in 11-5 and five last season, which was the same as the um, Ravens. Their projected Vegas win total is the same as the Ravens going into the year, which is 10.5 wins. But you have them dubbed as the number one in the division, huh? I do. And, and coming from me, who has always been an anti-Browns fantasy manager, which is basically stay away. I don't trust the franchise. I don't trust their moves. I don't trust their coaches. I don't trust anything, and it's worked and you, out great. And you personally hate like Odell on a deep level. Sure, um, guilty as charged. Uh, it, it, look, it's worked out great, but my head is not stuck in the sand. The you know the the addition of Kevin Stefanski has changed the organization top down. They're working together. Their general manager and head coach are 
uh, gelled and the transactions they've been making and the the improvement. I love what they did for their draft, especially on the defensive side of the ball. I think this is just going to be a winning team. Isn't, a team that, that goes isn't out this the games. time that they pull the rug out from under your perceptions? Isn't that what the Browns do? That is. Isn't this the year where they they were seven and three in one score games? We just made an argument against Pittsburgh in one score games. Cleveland did the same thing. Yes, that is true. The difference is this roster coming into this year has now been improved. Whereas, you know, the Steelers roster has been. Ooh. Oh, man. You're looking for a word that's the yeah. opposite of improved? Deproved. Deproved. Yeah. Uh, unproved. I'm just kidding. It was unproved. <laughs> um, has gotten worse. So, it has. Um, yeah, but I, I, I really think the Browns are going to be a team that wins the division. And that's crazy to say out loud. Um, for fantasy purposes, last year, 27th in pace of play, fourth in rush attempts third in rushing yards, 28th in pass attempts, right? So um, this is, uh, you know, a run first team with a very efficient Nick Chubb who was amazing. He's the only running back in the modern era to run for 1,000-plus yards and nine-plus rushing touchdowns in fewer than 13 games played. I mean, that he's the only one. So when he's on the field, he's taking over. And I think a similar question about Baker and the passing offense should be asked that we ask of Lamar and the passing offense in Baltimore, which is you're asking Baker and the Stefanski offense to fill the cup of Kareem Hunt, Odell Beckham, Jarvis Landry, and Austin Hooper. Can he do it? Can those four pass catchers give you the kind of fantasy value that you would hope for? No, I, I, don't, I don't think they can. Um, and while I do expect them to throw the ball – more than they did last year. You have to remember, um, it's so hard, and this is why we try to take a holistic approach of each team and remember their circumstances through the season. For fantasy purposes, for stats purposes, throwing the ball and passing yards numbers, the weather for a handful of games in a row for Cleveland last year was truly otherworldly, where you, you just can't throw the ball and make completions. Now, it's worth noting they still play in Cleveland. Yeah, they haven't moved. They haven't moved, and the weather there is terrible. Hey, I got an idea, Cleveland. Build a dome, okay? You <laughs> have been on the dome campaign for a while It's just for NFL teams. I mean, this whole thing, this brutal Every time you pride, see a bad weather game. It's just like, oh, we're tough. We, look at us. We're fans out in the rain. And look, I'm proud of you. Like, enjoy it. Have fun. But we I'm have just the technology. You, you could have gone indoors and enjoyed the game just as much. If well, I mean, if they had indoors, um, didn't they build a new stadium that wasn't a dome recently in a bad weather city? I think that's where it really like, look, I get it. You got an old one. You didn't think about a dome in the seventies or whenever you're building your stadium. Yeah. That's fine. You build a new stadium in bad weather. That's in a, not a dome. What are you doing? Unless you're green Bay. That's the only place that I think. It's oh, allowed. so you're willing to be tradition in green just Bay for green Bay. I'll allow it. Cause it's just too classic and snow like rain. Rain? It, that's not a classic <laughs> game. It's rainy. It's windy. Nobody's enjoying that. Isn't it supposed to be an advantage for these teams that the, that play at their home stadium? Only Lambo. It's not an advantage for us as fantasy analysts to try to project those and predict those. Would you rather draft a Raven wide receiver or a Brown wide receiver? Genuine uh, question. Genuine because, question. I would rather draft a Brown wide receiver. If I had to draft one it would be Jarvis Landry in the ninth round uh between those two teams Jarvis Landry is not allowed to be picked here now pick a Raven or a Brown from the to be one of your wide receivers okay if I if that's if if we're making these rules then it's Marquise Brown at the end of the oh, ninth round. oh over Odell Odell's not on my draftable oh my list God. he's really not he's just not he's just, off my list I was just trying to find a way to get you into yeah, watch, Odell watch take take Marquise Brown out all right, Marcus I'll take Rashad Brown. Bateman. Oh my gosh! All right, so um, big picture here. I I'm really not sure what to do with Cream Hunt. We saw four weeks without Nick Chubb. He only averaged 12 more yards per game in those games. Here's the big headline: We came into the season. What did we say about Cream Hunt? Oh my goodness! The reception totals from the time we saw him. He had 38 receptions last year. Yeah, it was very disappointing was in the receiving. one more than the eight games in 2019. So no extrapolation applied to Kareem Hunt's season. Now, he scored. He was actually okay to play in fantasy for a good part of the year. He was good. But, I look, he's just in the category of, like, 
wild card that I don't know. I never knew when to play him. I just kept doing it, and it kept working out. I was going to say, if you didn't know when to do it and you just played him, you were disappointed for three and a half quarters over and over and over, and then at the end of the week, you're like, oh, man, glad I played Kareem Hunt. He was good, but he was disappointing because when Chubb went out, he didn't dominate the way that we thought he was going to, um, and he had a stretch of games once we started relying on him and trusting him that was a little disappointing. Kareem Hunt is uber-talented. There, you just can't debate that. When I'm looking at, okay, the the passing work, and it didn't jump up the way that we hoped based on the eight games from the year prior, so which one is the truth? I'm going to bet more on his ability, because we've seen both. We've already literally seen it. I would bet more towards, uh, not not all the way towards the, the eight-game stretch we saw, but he's going to catch the ball a little bit more. He's going to be involved. Kareem Hunt is just too good of a player to not be involved. No and Beckham I, all last year, though. I mean, those, there are going to be targets, whether you like it or not, for Nodell, as I'll call, as you can call him, Nodell Beckham. Well, I mean, if I called him that, it would be because he's probably not on the field. Oh, okay. Or on your team. But, he, look, he's going to get targets. There's no way that he doesn't have 100 targets in the offense if he's healthy. So let me ask you this. Kareem Hunt right now is in the back of the fourth. He's like at the 4-5 turn right I'm now. Passing. He's going right next to Miles Gaskin. Uh, I know. I'll pass on Kareem. You'd rather have Gaskin than Hunt? I know how good Nick Chubb is. I know that every time you take him off the field, you're putting an inferior player on, and Kareem Hunt's really good. I don't know that that's true. I think it's true in every way, shape, and form. It's not true in the receiving game. I think that, it, it might be. That's ridiculous. Did you see Nick Chubb, what he did with, with his opportunities in the passing game? Yeah, but that doesn't mean he's a great pass catcher. That means that he's unexpected to be the receiving back and gets opportunities. All I'm saying is that I know Nick Chubb's a better running back than Kareem Hunt. Sure. He, he might be the best running back in the NFL. You talk about the age and the wall and, and Derrick Henry. Nick Chubb is young. Nick Chubb is an outlier. Nick Chubb is the center of this entire Stefanski offense. So here's the interesting so thing. So it just makes me scared. Here's the thing about that. So let's talk about Nick Chubb on this team. We know they want to run the ball. We know he's unbelievable. He was on pace for like 1,600 rushing yards last year. Um, he's the sixth pick right now on average in drafts. That's too high for me. I don't, uh, you talk about him as the best running back in football. He doesn't catch the ball. Um, not much. Not enough to be a big factor for fantasy. And if I'm in the top half of my fantasy draft, I'm not taking a running back that doesn't catch the ball, not named Derrick Henry. Yeah, I think that's the thing, is you can put him in the same category as Derrick Henry. I think it's a fair thing to do. I haven't done it. You haven't done it. Mike has. Mike has him at five. You and I have Chubb at 10 and 11 for those reasons, because we don't think there'll be enough passing work, and because they... they they have a right to take him off the field for a quarter. Like, if they're winning a game, they just have the luxury, not the right, the luxury of putting Kareem Hunt in anytime they want. And that is what we saw. You think that Hunt might come in only when you're down and he's the pass catching back, but there were plenty of games where when they were uh, up and you'd expect, okay, this is a Hunt lead, you know, run out the lead moment. It was like, oh, now, now, or a Chubb run out the lead. Now Hunt was on the he, field. Here's the thing, though. I, I will point this out to you because maybe it'll change your mind. From the time Nick Chubb back, came back from injury, which was eight full games, that's 1,500-yard pace, 17-touchdown pace, and how many? 27 reception pace. 27 would be 11 fewer than Kareem Hunt had last year, and Kareem Hunt had the benefit of a four-game stretch without Nick Chubb. So when you talk about reception difference between the two of them, it wasn't that much. Uh, I mean, I From I, the time that he came back. Yeah, five receptions in a game. You had to do a lot of mental gymnastics to get to wasn't that much of a difference. No, um, I didn't. Yeah, I mean you're no. saying in a certain stretch they of played the together game, if for you the last late that out, then he's close. eight games. So from the time he came back, him and Kareem Hunt side by side for eight straight weeks to end the year, which you said earlier this off season. they figured that offense out over the course of the year. Kevin Stefanski first year. Yeah, because Odell Beckham went out. Okay. I'm just pointing out there's a just very small difference in reception totals. There. I think that for fantasy purposes, Nick Chubb's ceiling is... Can he finish is, number one? No. No way. That's Okay, that's a question. That's what I... Brooks, would, Brooks, can he finish number one? Yes. You're wrong, Brooks. Do you guys want to fight? I'll take no. a, I'll take a number one finish water bet if anybody wants to do that. <laughs> Of course you will. That's your kind of bet. Uh, first four games for the Browns. Kansas City in Kansas City. That'll be a tough first week. Then Houston. That'll be a nice second week. And Chicago, Minnesota. So um, rubber's going to meet the road for the Browns. Uh, I think the Ravens are the best team in this division by a lot. 
I think the Ravens are going to win it. Um, I think it's Browns, Steelers after that. And then the dark horse. Genuinely, the dark horse in the division. Cincinnati. They're more of a tiger, but... That's fair. Out. Yeah. Yeah. A dark tiger or a striped horse? Striped tiger. Are they the striped... Uh, let's okay. just call them a Bengal. All right. Last year, 4-11 and 11 and 1. Uh, they played Cleveland close in both their games. They beat Pittsburgh once. Zach Taylor's record through two years, 6-25 and 1. Not great. Uh, it's not great at all. Have had some few things up against them. But last year, 29th in points per game. 14th in pass attempts, 17th in rush attempts, dealt with injuries to both Mixon and Joe Burrow. The storyline for this team has been, hey, Joe Burrow, tons of volume. Zach Taylor gave tons of volume to Andy Dalton when he was the quarterback. Gave it to Burrow right out of the gate, no warm-up period. But it was a very inefficient passing game. And I know that you'd love to lay it all at the feet of A.J. Green. But I went and dug into that a little bit. It was just inefficient through and through. He was 9 of 48 on deep targets, right? Mm -hmm. That's the third lowest adjusted completion percentage on deep targets. A.J. Green was awful. T. Higgins had more. T. Higgins had quite a few more deep targets than A.J. Green did. And more catches. Uh, he did. He did. But they, it wasn't good, though. I mean, you look at the deep target success as a whole, it wasn't just A.J. Green letting them down. It was a bad, deep passing game through and through. Not having A.J. Green, I admit, will help. You add Jamar Chase, and you hope that those connections start to happen. Um, even the best are, what, 40, 35 40% on mm -hmm. those deep passing games. But what are we expecting out of this Bengals offense this year? Uh, you know, you hope the offensive line is going to be improved. I mean, they were 30th last year. It has to be improved. I mean, when you add Panay Sewell at the number five pick. Oh, wait. Oh, no, they didn't. Oh, no, they didn't do that. They wanted to get another wide receiver in there. Yeah, they got Jamar Chase. He plays. Um, I feel like they bungled that one. <laughs> is that like a bangled? Yeah, it was a bangled jab. You could have gone bangled. Yeah, I didn't really know which way to go. Them. Okay, but you win some, you lose some. But you're you're content with where you went. I'm gonna stay where I was. Bungled. Yeah. The Bengals bungled. The Bengals bungled. Um, yeah, go on. Well, I just laying it out there for you. You've got a hopefully better offensive line, despite not investing that pick. They do get their first round pick back from last season. They were trying to invest on the offensive line. Maybe they felt burnt, Jason. Maybe they felt like, man, we did that last year. And all he did was get hurt. Let's get Jamar Chase. He's he's big and sexy, and he's going to run down the field. So from the Bengals' point of view, um, the reason that I was so confident in Jamar Chase being the pick going into the draft, even though that isn't what I was going to do or would have done, they believe in the actual pieces on this offensive line. Like to a man, to a position, they're confident in where it is going into 2021. Uh, that's why I didn't think they were going to go Sewell um, and, and the truth is this offensive line will be much, much better than it was last year. The problem is Burrow took a lot of sacks and, and some of them were definitely the offensive line's fault, but a lot of them were Joe Burrow's fault, wanting to be a hero, holding the ball too long. Maybe it was slow processing, but he showed flashes of brilliance. If he didn't get injured catastrophically, like his knee was destroyed, he would be such uh, a popular fantasy pick this season for me and I believe for you right now he is for most people I couldn't believe how high his he is. his ADP blows my mind he's the quarterback 12 he's being drafted as a quarterback one I don't think you should do that I do not think you should do that either and this offensive line may be improved but it might take time I mean look at Miami last season they had a lot of pieces but they were young you've got to gel you've got to come together you're playing in a division with the Browns defense and the Bengals def or I mean and the Ravens defense and the Steelers' defense. So you've got, what, six games already? This is the second or third best division in the league, and this is the clear worst team in it. If you took, re genuinely, Joe Burrow without an injury, you give him six of his games during your fantasy season against the Steelers, Ravens, and Browns? I'm not excited about any of those matchups. You talk about streaming quarterback decisions. If you're sitting there, you'll ne you would never stream Joe Burrow against those three teams. No, no, you wouldn't choose that as a streaming matchup. The, maybe if the Browns don't come through with the improvement uh, that we expect them to have, maybe the Browns are okay, but you wouldn't stream against Ravens. You wouldn't stream against uh, the Steelers. And, and the issue with Burrow is 
whether or not he will be able to do what he's going to be able to do this year in week one. When you draft him at the 12th quarterback overall, you're saying, I'm starting him week one. I'm starting him week two. He had a torn ACL and MCL with additional damage in the knee joint, and he's a mobile quarterback. So your choices for Joe, Murrow, Joe Burrow is start him week one coming off the injury, which is risky business against Minnesota at home. And yep. then you get to go on the road against the Bears and the Steelers. Not good, not good. So yeah, why, so, so why draft him? Don't don't draft Joe Burrow. I mean, if you're in a dynasty league, I love Joe Burrow's sure. outlook, and and you know you want to draft him high in a startup. Fine with that. Uh, in a redraft league, if Burrow has a wonderful breakout season where he really takes a step and becomes a top five fantasy quarterback, it's going to happen the second half of the year where you can trade for him and not, not just have to draft them and get losses on the way to that. I am the lowest of the three of us. I've met 21, you at 17, Mike at 19, none of them close to his QB 12 ADP. So I think he's like off our boards completely when it comes to – like he's going to get drafted before we tell you to draft him. I know that. Yeah. Um, they're kind of the opposite Ravens to me. The Ravens are super efficient on the offensive side of the ball, low pot, like low amount of pass attempts. Um. I feel like you're going to need a lot of pass attempts, a lot of comeback attempts, but that could provide a lot of value for Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Joe Mixon, if Mixon is out there three downs. Yeah, I, I think Mixon is going to be the clear fantasy star from this roster because it's Joe Mixon and nobody. Say what you want about how bad Giovanni Bernard has been over the last couple of years, but he's been out there taking snaps, he's been out there taking targets, and he's not there anymore. Joe Mixon will be a true three down back. The question is, will he place, you know, enough games to be worth it? If he's out there, I think he's a great pick. One of my favorites this year. Right now he's going at the two oh six. And to get a three down running back at, in the second round, I think is just great value. You liked what you saw, and albeit you only saw him for six games last year. But you had two of the last three games on the road at Baltimore, Indianapolis, two good defenses, ends up with six receptions in one of those games, 24 rushing attempts in one of those games. Uh, and, you know, the, the tool set is there. He just needs to stay healthy. Yeah, that is all it is. And, and you know, his specific injuries, they don't strike me as anything that, should be reoccurring or cause a higher, you know, rate of reaggravation. It's not, you know, soft tissue issues. Um, Last year's uh, 17 game pace with Geo there was 337 rushing attempts and 59 receptions. Yeah, I mean he, he he's great. So draft this Joe Mixon in year. the second. This this is the the best opportunity to get him because he's out of value right now. The Odell real... Beckham Jr. or Jamar Chase, you have to draft one of them. Beckham is going in. Oh, they're they're back to back. Oh, this is a delight. This is spectacular. They're back to back in drafts. You get to put one of them on your roster in the sixth round, Jason. You lucky dog. I would. Uh, oh man, they're back to back. I would draft. Kill. If I so this is only I have to draft one of these two. That's the game we're playing. I just that's want the game that we're playing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's what I said. I would draft. Oh, oh man, I would draft Odell Beckham Jr. <gasps> you just said that you'd rather draft Hollywood. Here, here's here's the thing. <laughs> I disparage Odell Beckham Jr. Yep, as, you do. Um, you know, he really is off my board. I do, I don't want to deal with it. I don't believe he'll have a great season. But I do see the route to it. He's 29 years old. He had a couple big weeks last year um, and was injured. So if he comes back and has a good season. Um, How I, do you not see the route for Jamar Chase? So with Jamar Chase, the route, the the difficulty that I have is that I know Tyler Boyd's going to get his, right? He's the, he's the slot guy. He's going to take a ton of targets, 130. That's just slotted in. I really strongly believe that this season, T. Higgins – is a better fantasy option. Just he'll have more more value than Jamar Chase's rookie year. Um, Jamar Chase, you know, he didn't play football last year. Um, this is a guy who's coming in as a rookie, and they're gonna they're gonna feed him the ball. I they know fed it to AJ Green, I but T. Higgins is coming into a year two where he had a great year one, 
And I, I just don't see Chase having a better year in 2021. Do you think Odell Higgins. Beckham is going to be better or worse than 67 for 908 and 6? Worse? Worse? Yeah. Yeah, that was T. Higgins' rookie season. It was 67, 908 and You six. didn't say I could draft T. Higgins here. I'd take no, T. Higgins I, over I, at both of these guys. I didn't guys. say you could. Uh, my point is, if you can see the path, you just said you could see the path for Odell Beckham having a successful season. If the path for a successful season wasn't painted by T. Higgins last year, the draft pedigree, physicality, the touchdown prowess of Jamar Chase is a higher ceiling than T. Higgins' rookie year without Joe Burrow. But my, I mean, you're you're actually making my case for me, and you don't realize it. I just said how good a rookie season T. Higgins had. He did, but that's for a rookie. Like he had a good rookie season not a good fantasy season he was the wide you receiver just said 30 you believe that Beckham would be worse than the rookie season for T Higgins but you're not saying that there's a path for Jamar Chase to be better I I, I see a path for both of these guys it's a matter of whether you're talking about what you're projecting and what you're putting probabilities on versus what could happen and what you see a path for you just said you chose Beckham because you saw a path for him and you didn't see one for Chase I don't see a path for Chase to be better than T Higgins this year I will bet you anything in this earth water, over that. Water one. bet, twenty twenty one fantasy finish. T Higgins versus. I feel Jamar like Chase. I want more on that bet. Like T Higgins versus Jamar Chase. Mike would be proud of me here. Okay. What All is right. Mike oh, sipping I, on the I beaches got it, I got right it, I got now? It, I got it. I got it. Okay, go for it. Okay. Uh, whatever you want to order, bourbon and bones. Other person pays. Oh, that's a very fancy it, restaurant. It's a very fancy restaurant. Okay, oh, so oh, we've oh, got man. a bourbon and bones. Yeah. Bet. Loser buys. And the water. Go T. Higgins. Water bet. That's Brooks. Make sure this doesn't get forgotten when yeah. Jamar Chase blows T. Higgins out of the water. For the record, if it wasn't obvious to those out there, I would take Jamar Chase over T. Higgins 10 times out of 10 in his rookie season. They're being drafted four picks apart. Okay. I've just been. <laughs> oh, yes, Brooksy. I've just been informed we have already made this bet <laughs> this offseason. Well, we haven't made the bourbon and bones. Bet. No, that bet is great um, as long as I win it. Otherwise, it's going to be expensive. Um, oh, yeah. You know I'm not going to be shy on that ordering no, process. No, I know. Caviar, please. Um, man, that'll be that'll be fun. All right, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, big bet a bet. That's great. Anything else from this team that you want to dig into? They start, like I said, Minnesota at Chicago at Pittsburgh. The win total for Vegas has them at six and a half, which would be a two and a half game improvement. Two and a half game improvement over right. their four wins. Well, and they've got an extra game to do it. All right. Final wrap up questions for this divisional breakdown. A little longer show, but hey, look, this is what it's all about. Who wins the division? I'm going to go Ravens. You're going I'm go Browns. Browns. Uh, toughest player to project in the division? Uh, genuinely, it's Odell Beckham Jr. for me. I'll say Kareem Hunt. Uh, sneaky player for 2021. Is there a sneaky uh, dynasty add-on or player that stands out for you in this division? I feel like the sneakiest player is probably Gus Edwards. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Well, but I said it, so find one else. So find oh, one. man, another player? Uh, Rashad yeah. Bateman. He's sneaky. I think there's a world where uh, we're just wrong about the success in the passing game and Bateman takes over. You think? I think they might be begging for that. Yeah, I mean, it, I think that uh, I think that Harbaugh wants it. Let me tell you what I realized today. Um, I hate I hate rookies that oh. aren't running backs. I hate rookie wider rookie pass catchers in the draft season. Uh, I've I brought this up in the past a lot. Rookie wide receivers who have great rookie years usually are second half of the year breakouts. They don't get off to strong starts. Yeah, and, and you can even make the case that the Greatest rookie season of all time. I mean, it still was a few games for Justin Jefferson to get going. Right. First two games, he By wasn't the way, there. Odell Beckham's great rookie season. He was gone for the first month or so. I was digging into those deep target percentage of deep targets caught. Jefferson was number one in all of football in terms of catching the highest percentage of those deep targets. Speaks to Kirk Cousins, I think, as much as Jefferson. But um, I actually thought what you had said you had learned was that the Suns had won game one of the NBA Finals. Oh, they did! <laughs> Suns and four. And for all my Bucks fans out there, Bucks fans, listen up. Bucks and six, this is what I hear. Bucks and six, it's kind of your thing. I just want to remind you all that Bucks and six came from one of your players predicting that, and then you got swept that year, just like you're going to get swept this oh, year. Oh, you go. Bucks and six, baby. 
<laughs> we waited till the end. Yeah. I mean, welcome. we're so generous. We're so kind. This divisional breakdown show is over. But the AFC South breakdown, Jason, it's not coming Tuesday. It's coming Saturday. Extra episode this week. Until then. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.